Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'd like to thank Sudan for the opportunity to present and uh, speak my mind freely. Uh, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is CAD, which is computer-aided diagnosis uh, specific to pathology. And uh, I'm going to focus on digital pathology, but of course we could be talking about any kind of data, not just imaging data. And uh, as a pathologist uh, trying to push the field forward, I would like to present some of the pros and the cons, not just all the hype, but some of the problems and limitations that uh, all of us in this room have to overcome. Uh, I do consult for the company Hamamatsu, so I wanted to put that forward as my disclosure, but that, uh, my relationship with Hamamatsu will not influence the content of the current talk. So my aim is first to, let's look at computer-aided diagnosis specifically, so we're all on the same page, and then I'll run through some of the pros and the cons, and perhaps a little bit differently to what most speakers do is always push the pro that you should go home and you should convince your lab to do all of the stuff. I'm going to push some of the cons and then at the end, uh, we can conclude together a little bit about some recommendations for all of us going forward and set the stage for some of the talks for the rest of uh, the conference. Some general facts about artificial intelligence are the fact, number one, that this is a reality today. We're no longer talking about uh, science fiction Hollywood stories. 61% uh, of people interviewed around the world feel that artificial intelligence is actually going to make the world a better place. So they view it positively. 55% of people would be willing to jump into a car with Uber, etc., without a driver. So they have faith in the technology to do so. And when patients are interviewed, 57% of those would feel comfortable going to see an artificial intelligence doctor to do their eye exam. Of course, what about a pathologist? Uh, predictions, and in fact it's happened just this year alone in 2007, there's been a 300% growth in companies, including Google and others that have invested in artificial intelligence. Uh, and that includes in pathology too. And when you start to speak to the people that that impacts, and even pathologists one-on-one, -on -one, concern is of course that are we going to be replaced by machines? So specifically towards healthcare, artificial intelligence. That, what we're talking about is the use of computer algorithms, software, to perform the tasks we do as physicians which is to approximate human cognition, to analyze complex medical data, not simple stuff. And we've seen this throughout medicine. We've seen things introduced such as fuzzy logic, Bayesian networks, and artificial neural networks. But over the time that this has happened, lots of things have happened in the world outside of medicine that have enabled this to happen now, such as much better computing power, Many people around the world have gone on to electronic health records, and in so doing, we've had this growth of electronic and this digital data that's sitting out there to be analyzed, and the field of computer vision has advanced a lot too. So we have kind of this perfect storm in which to apply this, and you've seen some recent projects out there, and this is in the popular press. Uh, Google DeepMind, IBM Watson, they're now applying this technology to healthcare. For those of you we're not aware, Google have made an image analysis algorithm that can detect breast cancer in lymph nodes. Uh, there was a chameleon competition, lots of folks were asked to use a universal database and come up with an image algorithm. Google unofficially won the competition, they entered but they didn't register per se, and so their algorithm really with high accuracy outperforms pathologists in trying to find breast micrometastases. Now, I welcome that because for those of you who have sat and looked at slide after slide worrying that you're missing one or two small, you know, single lobular carcinoma cells in a lymph node, you know, why not use technology like that? But Google are thinking about solving and they have already solved this uh, problem. So these are some of the trends in general with image analysis, specific to pathology. The first is that if you look at all these publications out there where people have done predictive business analysis, you know, in, in so many years' time, uh, digital pathology is going to be worth so many millions of dollars. But all of them say the same thing, which is the emphasis and where people are focusing investment, where the most money will be made, is on the software side. Not the hardware side, the scanners, the servers, cloud storage, etc. It's on the software side. It's the applications. Uh, it's not selling the cell phones, it's the apps on the phones they, that the value is. As a result, there are a lot of players now, new ones, and especially after the FDA approval in the US for whole site imaging, for primary diagnosis, a lot of new companies are saying, well, maybe we should get into this, because that's where the money is, that's where the application is. So there's a lot of new players 
out there uh, making apps, basically. And if you speak to pathologists and pathology labs out there, the reason, one of the main reasons for them to adopt digital pathology platforms is not so much for sharing images. It's really at the end of the day to make sure that you're on a platform that you can capitalize and leverage all these image algorithms that will be coming your way. At the same time, for the surgical pathologists, the histopathologists in the room, you know that we're, we're no longer being asked just to provide this sort of qualitative practice of medicine. They, they're no longer interested in our descriptions. It's more quant quantitative. So they're more interested in the HER2 new scores, and now the PDL1 scores, and CD30 and ALK scores. And that's because precision medicine, the era we're in now, is asking us as pathologists to provide precision diagnostics because that's the kind of personalized care that's required. And it's very difficult for humans to keep that accurate and standardized. Computers are far better at that. At the same time, many of the applications out there that could do some of these things were stuck in research journals and the research space. And we're seeing more and more of those being translated over into the clinical space. It's not easy. They cost a lot of money to do that. They have to, end users have to be happy in, to use those uh, user interfaces, and they have to jump through lots of regulatory hurdles, but that is happening now. And there's a lot of hype around computer-aided diagnosis. I'm sure many of you, some of you are, yeah, are forward thinkers for your labs, are involved in digital imaging, digital pathology, or other kind of big data, and people will probably be asking you, when are you going to give up your microscope? When can we have these apps? My chairman certainly asks me all the time, when are we doing this? When are we doing that? So there's a lot of hype around this. There's also a lot of terms that have been introduced over time. One of the terms, CPATH or computational pathology, has been introduced into our literature. And I'm not exactly sure what it is, it's certainly been well defined, but I don't, I don't see me, uh, myself or people in my department practicing this, because the true definition published in the literature does, does not apply to pathology. What I think applies is the following. There's a lot of big data out there, PATH reports, lab data, etc., and we're Acquiring lots of images. Many of you in your labs have been scanning slides or thinking about scanning slides. With the computing power today to analyze all those multiple parameters, we will probably be able to do computer-aided diagnosis. Now, the vendors in the room will say that's to assist pathologists. The pathologists in the room will be honest and tell us that's really to replace pathologists. I recently got into the elevator at my hospital with a a senior neurosurgeon who told me, hey, you're one of those guys that doing machine learning, etc." and he said, Really, his complaint to me was, why am I facilitating and enabling machine learning and coming up with algorithms, etc., to replace physicians and not the middle management? He really wanted me to have artificial intelligence to replace middle management in healthcare in the US. Now, there are two approaches, and some of these are combined. There's the approach on the left, which is the so-called deep learning approach. You put all data into a computer, goes to this convoluted neural network and gives you the answer. And sometimes the more data you put, gives you a better answer each time. It learns from itself. The other more traditional approach, and I'll explain this a little bit later, is a more traditional image analysis. You have a pathologist annotate something and the computer mimics the pathologist. Uh, machine learning today actually has a little bit of both of those. You do some training, some annotation, but the rest you just put in data into a computer and it comes up with an answer. Now, I've got two boxes over there, an open box and a closed box. The closed box is when you put lots of data into a computer and it comes up with an algorithm to give you an answer, uh, usually it's the correct or the better answer than a human would provide, is okay, but it's a black box inside that computer. Because you don't know, number one, if every time the computer follows the same reasoning and rationale to come up with an answer. And the second point is, it's going to be very hard for folks that make those algorithms, I'm not saying they're not needed, but folks to convince the regulatory bodies that this can go through regulation because you know, they connect the dots and this is how it works, because they're not going to be able to do so. On the other side, you know, with the traditional image analysis, is an open box, because you can explain to anyone, including a pathologist or an FDA, uh, you know, federal regulatory guy, that uh, this is how we annotated endothelial cells, this is how it counted you know, blood vessels for angiogenesis and so forth. So, we have limitations as humans, and this particular uh, illusion known as the Edward Abelson checker uh, shadow illusion is well known to probably many of you. If you look at that, block A and block B on that checkerboard are exactly the same color. 
If you don't see that, that means that your brain is playing tricks on you, okay, because they are exactly the same color. Um, and that's a limitation of humans. If you asked a computer to analyze A and B, it would give you that they're exactly the same color. And that's a problem for us in pathology when we're looking at brown stains, red stains, and we have to score those and give intensity readings and so forth, that we don't probably all do the same thing. We are not given the same yardstick in which to provide those measurements. And that's a big problem. Um, how big a problem? Uh, the literature is full of examples. So this is a recent paper I read, just uh, published a short while ago, on some researchers who took 71 breast cancer cases that had HER2 scoring on them. And 12 of the cases were discordant. The computer did not agree with the human. And in fact, the humans were all incorrect. The computer was correct, proven so. And the reason that the humans were incorrect because those particular cases with HER2 new staining had a lot of heterogeneity, and just like that checkerboard illusion, fooled the pathologist into giving an incorrect score. The computer was not tricked by that. So that is why uh, you know, we should take uh, these computer tools seriously. So let's look at some of the advances. The thumbs up for computer-aided diagnosis in pathology. As shown you that computers can be more accurate than we are. They're much more precise, especially if we're trying to quantitate things, give an exact score. They're much more uh, amenable to having everyone provide the same score. In other words, there's standardization, reproducible. If I gave you all the same image and asked you to give it a score, we probably would not get a 100% uh, you know, uh, exact answer, but the computers would do so, especially with all these indeterminate categories and complex scoring systems as we have. That's why when we have grayscale scores like HER2 not being positive or negative, but sort of a 2 plus, we have to send it out for fish. And all of that could be eliminated with computer scoring. The other thing pathologists are excited about, as well as the vendors in the space, is the efficiency that computer image analysis brings. Uh, saves pathologists time, counting mitotic figures, counting, uh, you know, uh, KI67 and so forth. But the real thing then, the real advantage would be if the computer algorithms applied pre-imaging, sort of streaming before they even come to me, would triage my cases. Take all the prostate cancer cases, take all of those that are negative and put them aside and just present me with the positive ones. Uh, I spoke to Ian Katz, right, about dermatopathology. Tell me which of my derm cases require levels up front. So that's the kind of efficiency we're talking about. And that obviously will make a big difference. We've seen a few of these algorithms out there, but computer-aided diagnosis will soon help pathologists find, diagnose, and grade cancer. Uh, and so, it's, as, I, as I said, it's not Hollywood fiction. Paper published uh, a while ago in uh, Modern Pathology using VisioFarm software with several pathologists around Europe showing that computer-aided diagnosis outperforms pathologists. Maybe not by leaps and bounds, but certainly marginally and enough to change someone's chemotherapy decision. So many people have asked, what is the killer app in pathology? I've been asked by several vendors, well, what is the killer app in pathology? The kill a killer app is an application that you need and desire so much that you're willing to spend any amount of money for the platform to run that app. So if, for example, kids asking their parents to please buy them smartphones so they can use Snapchat. Okay, so Snapchat is a perfect killer app today because all kids want to be on Snapchat, but in order to do so, they need a smartphone with an operating system. In my opinion, and there are lots of algorithms out there, but in my opinion, when people ask me what's the killer app, it should not be something that simply replaces what I do at the microscope, doing it a little bit more quicker, but something that completely uh, uses the data of the image plus other metadata that I cannot do at my microscope alone. That would be a killer app for me to spend millions of dollars on a digital pathology platform and make sure everyone else in my department is on that same platform. There are a few of these that are attempting to make waves for those GI pathologists, gastrointestinal pathologists in the room. You've probably been asked to run immunoscore on your colon cancer cases. There's a company in France called Halio DX. You can see they came up with T cell quantification in a center of a colon cancer, the tumor, and on the invasive margin. And they come up with a score of all the T cells, and this will give you better prognosis for your patients than the traditional TNM staging. I, my gastrointestinal uh, folks want this all the time, our oncology center wants this, but there are lots of hurdles to go through for this. The test, for example, in the US, if I need to run it, 
I need to send to a clear lab. It's very expensive for an individual test. So it's not translated at present for routine clinical use, which is one of the problems. There are papers like this that reach people. So Stanford published a paper, for example, showing that a computer can be designed to look at lung cancer and not only accurately diagnose the subtype of cancer, but predict severity prognosis better than pathologists can. If you read the paper, there are flaws in that paper. But nevertheless, it's this kind of hype that people read, such as chairmen, CEOs, and the folks that write the checks that are willing to provide you with the digital pathology tools to use uh, these kind of analyses. Now, this is a paper that made Andy Beck famous, his claim to fame. His paper showed that when he took breast cancer cases and he looked at features in those images of breast cancer, not just the traditional features we look at morphologically, such as glandular formation or mitotic figures, he looked at over 6,600 features, features that you and I wouldn't even bother to look at, for example. And he found that the most important features when you analyze an image of breast cancer are not the traditional ones we use, for grading and tumor staging and so forth, but the features that we wouldn't even think about, such as some stromal features, are much more predictive of how these patients sh should work. So there is lots of information, zeros and ones in those pixels, that we maybe could analyze. And this is the kind of killer app that I'm talking about that I could not do at my microscope alone and would be worth our department spending millions of dollars and investing in undergoing the transformational change to a digital pathology platform to do this kind of stuff for our patients. Now, you don't just have to analyze the data, you can analyze the images. So this is what's called image-based retrieval. And pathologists do this all the time. If you're a pathologist and you get a hard skin at nexal cancer, or you're a pathologist and you get a difficult salivary gland tumor and you're not exactly sure what to call it, you go and you open a textbook, you look at the picture that Rezai took, or Bernie Ackerman took, and you do a wallpaper match and you say, yeah, I think this is what it is. So you're doing a mental visual map. Why can we not do the same with the images? So it's certainly possible, and Google have provided a tool to do that. So this is an exercise I had my fellow do last year. We took lots of digital pathology pictures of cancer, whole side images. We uploaded them to Google and asked Google on the top, for example, I just gave an image of a colloid carcinoma, and Google 50% of the time gave me the correct answer. When I added one term to it, such as the bottom was a, lyoma, a lyomyoma of the uterus, and I just said image plus uterus, 83% of the time Google gave me the right answer. And the more you refine it, the better. So that's not even pointed at a database that's been curated and handled by pathologists. So you can imagine now if you in your lab have your own image database uh, with diagnoses and the next time you have a difficult case, you can say what did we call such a case before, uh, probably with very high accuracy you would get the answer just on searching pixels. No need to go to reference books show it to an expert and so forth. There are currently one academic and two commercial products uh, that are not available for prime time yet, but soon will be for pathologists. Okay, so what are the downsides for CAD in pathology? Number one is they haven't always asked me or you what we would like and what we would build into designing these things. So the design of these things are sometimes clumsy, difficult for us to use, especially for day-to-day -day routine practice. While they may be nice, no one wants to go sit in the corner and log onto a separate system and try to run something that doesn't work every time. So I pointed out that there are two approaches that people are using to these machine learning tools. The traditional algorithm, if we run through it, is number one, having an expert annotate lymphocytes, endothelial cells, structures to tell the computer what it is, and then you calibrate that when you want to use it yourself. The problem that most vendors and people in the space have now is they are restricted to finding a pathologist and paying a pathologist consulting fees to sit down and annotate all these images. So it's a very slow process with low numbers of cases. And that's expensive and timely. So that's why we don't have hundreds of apps in pathology like we do on our cell phones. Some of these have gone through regulatory approval in the US FDA approval, in Europe CE mark approval, because you can connect the dots, as I pointed out. On the other end, the deep learning space, where everyone is very excited, what we're talking about is training a computer with thousands and thousands of images. If you have 100,000 images of a particular kind of cancer and throw it into the computer, and just ask the computer what other diagnoses, knowing the outcomes, the computer will eventually design an algorithm for you through its neural networks. When you want to use it, the problem is on 
at a different hospital, different institution, you will need to retrain it on your data set, uh, which is a little bit difficult, but can be done. The rate limiting step over here, the drawback is number one, is the size of the data needed. These vendors need large amounts of data to make this functional. And the quality of the data has to be good. So far, I'm not aware of anyone in pathology having had their, such an app approved through CE or FDA approval, such as the detection of uh, METs in, in lymph nodes or prostate cancer diagnosis and grading. Okay, that's the kind of app we're talking about. A little bit of technical background to an image algorithm. Uh, Facebook even use image algorithms when, they, when you tag your friends' faces. In fact, I stole those pictures at the bottom from Facebook. Didn't start, steal, sorry, borrow them from Facebook. Um, you can see the first thing is good algorithms deal with imaging processing, image pre-processing up front. Because we all have different H&E stains, different brown immunohistochemistry stains, the algorithm should normalize that first. Otherwise, it influences the data. The next thing is then classifying structures in your images, detecting or identifying those, segmenting them out, and then analyzing the features, quantifying, etc. So those are traditional steps involved. Now people ask me, it seems so easy, why are we not doing it for everything? So PDL1 is something everyone wants on every single tumor in our lab. Why are we not doing this by image analysis? I ask them, uh, you know, because even if there are some apps out there, and there are, OptraScan and others have some PDL1 apps out there, the problem is the following. Which drug are we matching to which antibody? Because these are companion diagnostics. The drug has to match the antibody. And then when you, match, when you decide which drug and which antibody, you have to say, what are we measuring? The staining in the tumor cells, the staining in the inflammatory cells. Then when I ask them about the tumor cells, are we counting the membrane staining? Are we counting the cytoplasmic staining? And then when I ask them, what cutoff do you want to be positive? You can see in the literature, the cutoff varies. 5%, 50%. And so you can build any app and it may not work for your specific patient, for your specific case, for your specific drug. At the end of the day, the oncologists often don't care, and they give the drug anyway. So it's the Wild West. And so here's the problem is the expectation. Everyone thinks computer-aided diagnosis and image analysis is going to be like Karen's, right, on the left. But when you bring it into your own lab and you start to use it and you hire staff, well, it's kind of, you know, your, what the vacation really is like when you get down to the beach to find a spot. Okay. It's not as fun and easy as they had told you. Let's take this image. Okay, so he has an image of Obama who has his foot on the scale, so that guy thinks he's heavier than he really is. Okay, if I, you all look at that image, if I asked you how many people are in the room, you would know. Uh, what color are the suits, you would know. But there's context to this image that you as a human being can uh, understand. And so if I ask you now, let's build a computer algorithm to analyze some of this. Okay, everything that you've understood about this image, we have to translate and explain to uh, a computer scientist to build the algorithm. So I did this with a colleague of mine. We have VisioFarm software, and we inputted this into VisioFarm software, that image, and we trained the algorithm. Uh, green is what suits should look like. You know, uh, pink is what the roof looks like. The floor is red, and so on and so on. We built the algorithm, so we have our own app now to am analyze images. And so when we run the image, okay, it doesn't do a bad job, but if I seriously need to distinguish shoes from suits, from hair, from shadows, well, they're all green, I would get the wrong answer. So it's not so simple on a simple image like that. Plus, you have no context of what really was in that image. So there are lots of variables to take into consideration before you do this. There are variables pre-imaging before you even begin with the image. Then there are variables when you're analyzing the image. And when you have the image, they're post-analytical variables. Let's take a couple of the pre-analytical ones, for example. The way your tissue is handled. If you have rotten tissue that's not well fixed, you're going to get terrible data, even if you run image analysis on that. We've learned that from breast markers with HER2 new. You require certain ischemia times, fixation times, in order to get good results. So, you know, if there's junk coming in, the image is not going to, and the analysis is not going to do any better. So the same way your slides are prepared, if they're full of tissue folds, the variation in the stain, you really need a standardization of the stain and the immunohistochemistry before you actually standardize the image analysis. And that really hasn't been done in the field yet, including the image acquisition, which images, which compression factors, and so forth. Assuming we have an ideal state before, and all labs are now perfect, and we have an image, what are the problems with the image itself? Number one is the algorithm. If you have an algorithm that's designed to work at 40x, look at nuclear features, 
and you run it on an image at 20x or 4x, it most likely will not work. Same thing is um, you know, running different algorithms. If I have different algorithms that count her to you, for example, I can't switch back and forth and assume that they will all give me the same answer. Many people do, but that's not true. The same thing is if you have a whole site image, what are you supposed to analyze? The whole image or just regions picked by me or the computer? Or and if you're going to say just regions, well, how many regions do we need to get an answer? And that comes up with the heterogeneity of tumors, as you're aware about these hot spots. Proliferating tumors have varying hotspots. How many of them are we supposed to count? People do not give us the answers. Plus, there's all dirt and bubbles, etc., on images that are all important. And if you speak to the computer scientists and you get down to the details, the nitty-gritty, and you ask them exactly what's going on here, for example, if a cell falls on a grid with the pixels and the cell's dead on the grid, do they count that cell as two in two different in squares, or do they ignore it? How is that handled? Because it can change the scoring system. So let's look at this example. I had lots of cases of breast cancer. He has a HER2 new image. It's completely compressed. So on the top left, it's only compressed to a factor of 200, and on the bottom right to a 4,000 compression. But if I ask the pathologist in the room, what's the HER2 score, whether it's on the top left or the bottom right, you'll all say 3+, plus, which it is. So the compression didn't affect your visual interpretation. But if I gave it to the computer algorithm, in this case I used a lockdown HER2 uh, algorithm from VisioFarm, it did not see the zeros and the ones in the bottom right because it was so compressed. It could not count all the membrane staining. So the score was way off. And in fact, whatever parameter I adjusted, how bright the image is, how dark the image is, if I compress the image, if there's a little area that's out of focus or blurred, you can see that your HER2 score will vary. So who's taking care of all of these factors on a daily basis for every single run, for every single patient, for every single slide? Uh, Dr. Combrink uh, did this for me. Uh, we were, he spent four months in Pittsburgh helping us validate different algorithms for breast cancer. And he has a case that was HER2 negative, but the algorithm actually called this positive. Why? Because it counted the membranes of the bubbles under the cover slip, which would be completely wrong if this was not supervised by a human being. So those are major problems. And in fact, we had two different algorithms we were trying to validate. One from Roche, uh, the Virtuoso software. One from VisioFarm. And you can see for just 20 breast cancer cases, when we compared the estrogen receptor scores and the KR67 scores for the exact same cases, the scoring was completely different. So depending on which software you use, your patients at your center may not get the same score as the next center, which is completely uh, you know, backwards because what we were trying to say is we're trying to adopt software to standardize this. Scanners themselves are variable. Yeah, I had my fellow put on the same slide with TMA cores on every week analyze them, exact same slide, exact same scanner, exact same algorithm, but it was a lot of variability from week to week. The dip there was because we changed the light bulb for maintenance on a scanner. So, you know, if you happen to come into our center, when we change the light bulb, you're not going to get your receptin, which is not good. So there requires a lot of calibration. And this becomes serious when we're talking about, you know, that's just within scanners, but between scanners it's even worse, it's exacerbated. He has a fantastic algorithm that Anand Madhubushi and his colleagues made that segments and, and finds and diagnoses prostate cancer. But if you run it on different scanners, you're going to, you know, detect different, breast, uh, diff different kind of glands and that's exactly not how the algorithm is designed to use, I mean to work. You really need standardization in the field and in your lab. What we are trying to achieve is an algorithm that's accurate, but not just accurate, precise, every single time we run it. So we want to aim for the bottom right. That's our target, and that's what we should do. The vendors need to help us with this, the regulatory bodies need to help us with this, and your own individual lab needs to make sure that that's how you're performing. The College of American Pathologists in the US have identified this as a major problem, and so we got together and we we're coming out with a guideline later this year, but we cannot tackle the whole field of image analysis. We decided to start with HER2 new quantification and from that let labs extrapolate uh, you know, good practices and good recommendations for validation and validating and using these devices. And you know, it takes into consideration things like can you use a homegrown algorithm? Does it have to be FDA approved? Does it have to be locked down? How do you do this in your lab? Do you do it for every case, every run? Uh, how exactly are you supposed to do this practically? How do you train people? And what kind of measurements do you need and metrics in place to perform, uh, to check your performance from a quality assurance perspective? So that will be coming out and hopefully be helpful. 
And, you know, that's why when you ask pathologists, if I speak to my pathologist at Al McGee Hospital to do breast uh, analysis of, the mo of breast markers with image analysis, they've tried it three times. We've had three different vendors, uh, and uh, this is the response I get when I come with a new vendor. So, okay, you didn't like the other one, let's try this one. So, you know, they just do not have time for this. And I do not blame them because uh, just like us, right, if you're going to use something, you'd much more comforting if it's integrated. And many of these platforms, the vendors have not worked with each other sufficiently enough so that it's just an easy click to get the right answer. There are some other hazards, especially when we're putting in all this big data, which is a big problem. It's the projects out there today, such as even IBM Watson and so forth, they've failed when they've been tested. Predictions that they're supposed to make have been inaccurate sometimes. And probably the modeling or whoever's designed this hasn't been exactly appropriate, certainly not in the pathology space. And part of the problem here is the reliability of the data that's going in. So many of us, not surprisingly, do not trust the technology. And the pathologists in the room that are at risk of being sued, you do want to know who's accountable. If I'm going to use your algorithm to diagnose breast cancer and grade it and stage it and predict, and I'm wrong, who's liable? Me, when I'm you know, in front of a jury? Or will the vendor be in my corner? So those are questions that have not been answered at this point in time. Now, in Pittsburgh, we have these driverless Uber cars. They drive around. Um, uh, I, I will be honest that when one pulls up at the traffic light with me, I let it go first for a few seconds, and then I go. But the question is, you know, all it requires is one or two of these events to happen. That some of these uh, Google's, uh, you know, driverless car have had one or two accidents, etc. that for people to lose faith in the technology. The other problem is the GIGO principle, garbage in, garbage out, which is a serious problem, right? If you're putting garbage in and, you're thinking you're going to, and you think you're going to get a great algorithm out of this, uh, you know, that's a problem. The problem is if you put garbage in even hundreds of thousands of cases, what if the diagnoses are wrong? Even if the model is fantastic, the output is going to be incorrect. So we don't really want apps like that in our field. Same thing. If you come to a lab, a very reputable lab, and you take all their whole site images and you put it in, whoever built that algorithm or designed that app, if it's no good, it's, it's still going to be trashy. We're looking for the jackpot, right? We're looking good data, good modeling, so we can trust the output. That's what we're looking for. And here's a great example. I don't know if any of you are aware of this criminal machine learning algorithm. It was a lot of hype. These two Chinese researchers came up with a wonderful algorithm. They looked at people's faces. They looked at uh, you know, over 1,800 images with facial features. They used this deep learning approach. And based on that, they were able to, with high accuracy, distinguish a criminal from a non-criminal. And uh, you know, they got this published until people started to look at what's exactly going on. And really what happened was criminals do not smile. Regular people smile. So this is just a good smile detector. Okay, so if you smile, you're not a criminal. So you know, we don't want to make that kind of mistake when we start to apply it to pathology. Okay, we just don't want smile detectors. We really need stuff that we can depend on. This is, and I'm ending off now, this is a really nice editorial written by Eric Topol. He's the, edit, uh, the editor of Medscape. Basically, what Eric said is, uh, pathologists have always embraced technology. Uh, yes, we may be resistant and technophobic, but we've really embraced technology compared to other physicians. We've brought stuff into our labs that count blood cells. We've brought technology like thin prep that have done applied image analysis to pap smears. We're not scared of technology. We will use it and leverage it to the best of our advantage. The problem is, oh, we're at an era now where can we use artificial intelligence, because this is presenting, this is the, we're being presented with this now, can we use it uh, to do what we do, the more complex tasks, and perhaps with better accuracy? So my final slide is my take home message for you based on that. Number one is, uh, hopefully I've demonstrated that just because a computer gives you an answer doesn't mean that it's always correct. So pathologist oversight will still be needed. Uh, Ken Bloom once told me that a fool with a tool is still a fool. Okay, so really, um, for us to use computer-aided diagnosis safely in the lab for our patients means we will have to pay attention to the things we're used to. Calibration, validation, practical guidelines, share our experiences. Personally, you know, people have asked me, are we giving up the microscope? Am I, uh, I hope so, that I can sit on the beach and sign out from there. But the truth is that I think it's unlikely that the computer... Uh, will re completely replace us and digital imaging will completely replace the need for me to even look at an image. 
I do think that the current job I'm doing now will be very different. And that, yes, I will have to redefine what I do, is what Eric Topol said. I will still be an information specialist, is what I am now, but using different tools, I will still be able to practice as a pathologist, but a different kind of information scientist. So again, thank you for the organizers for inviting me, for letting me speak my mind. And I'm happy to answer any questions if they are. Uh, if not now, I'll be around and at dinner tonight and happy to you know, have those conversations with you. Thank you. Thank you.